Given what we have learned about the unity of life, what is our responsibility with this information? First of all, what is our responsibility as priests? As priests, we are to know God, and I think we can use this information about the unity of life, the monomers and the similarities and the biosystems, to learn something, give insight into, first of all, the very nature of God, how it is that He is a one single God that is impressed upon us as we look at the monomer nature of life, the, of molecules, the similarities among organisms and the biosystems. At the same time, we have this spectrum of perfection of uh, similarity and systems that suggests that whatever this, whatever this unity is that brought things into being, it's a perfect unity. It seems to be far more, uh, our brains at least are encouraged to think that this entity is much more unified than the most unified things that we're aware of. And this suggests that God's perfect unity is illustrated in this fashion. And, it, and the wisdom of God necessary to create macromolecules in such a way that they're made of the same monomers and, and that uh, that allows for decomposition, digestion. Uh, it's just a really cool system, the integrated system. And then biosystems, the complexity necessary the wisdom necessary to create systems that work so well together with so many very complex components. We, we are in, we're led to believe, we are uh, led to conclude that God is an extremely wise, intelligent being. Beauty of God, uh, the, the simplicity of the monomer macromolecule system where all the macromolecules of the world can be built from just a few monomers. That's another one of those elegant systems. Very simple design, beautiful design to create something with extraordinary complexity. To be able to allow organisms to be unique from individual to individual yet all built from the same monomers is extremely elegant, beautiful, suggesting that God as creator is a beautiful God. Also the power, not just to think up how to do that, but to have the power to put it all together. And then finally, of course, the ability for us to, to recognize it is due to the fact that he has made it simple enough, laid it out as, as straightforwardly enough for us to see his very nature in those things that are made because he wants us to know him. So as I learn more about biosystems and similarities and monomers, uh, I am impressed with God's very nature, his oneness, his wisdom, his beauty, his power. And, and then also the fact that that incredibly great God wants me to know him. And there's so much to it that I, I'm almost compelled to do nothing but worship him. I have to worship him. The more I study monomers, similarities, and biosystems, the more I'm compelled to worship. And as I worship, I get excited enough to bring others in. And I encourage you to do the same thing because as you learn more about God by studying these sorts of things, as that results in you, uh, hopefully, uh, not being able to keep yourself from worshiping God and bringing others into worship, you are fulfilling your responsibility as a creation priest. In addition to our responsibility as priests, we have responsibility as kings. We have responsibility as kings to preserve the unity of the creation. For example, we have uh, a responsibility to preserve the unity of our bodies as biological systems. Realizing that our bodies are not just simply a bunch of parts put together, but parts put together in a very complex and extraordinary way to do some amazing things. We shouldn't do anything that compromises the ability of those bodies to do what they have been designed to do. There are a lot of parts. There are a lot of pieces that are interacting together. It's fairly easy to disrupt any of these pieces and thus affect the entire body. We should avoid doing anything that would compromise our body's ability to function. Remember, we're supposed to be rulers over those things that are made. As rulers, we're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
all the weeks of the year and our lives to take care of those things that God created. We're never off job. We have to be on call all the time. We need to be ready to take care of those things that uh, God has made. And we have to have a good mind about us at the time. We shouldn't be taking anything in or doing something to our, our bodies or our minds that compromise our ability to rule well. Things like smoking that break down the, uh, the ability of the components of our body to do those things they're supposed to do, like the lungs of our body, those things we should avoid. We should avoid things like alcohol and, and drugs that in fact compromise our mind's ability to make good decisions. Because God could come back at any moment asking, okay, now how did you take care of my creation? Did you do what you ought to do, ought to have done, to take care of those things that I made? We ought not do anything that compromises our ability to rule well. Secondly, we should preserve the unity in the among the biological creations that we see in the world about us. Included in this is to be careful of what we call in biology exotic introductions. There are wonderful communities of organisms out there in the world that God has created. Communities in the sea, in, on lakes and streams and on the land. When we bring in organisms and introduce them into communities where they aren't naturally living, we're introducing an organism into a, into a biological system, into something that's already there and has been functioning together with components in a very special way. Sometimes when you introduce that new organism, it's what's called an exotic introduction. In other words, take something that doesn't normally live there and introduce it into that. It sometimes doesn't work. It sometimes produces a catastrophic result in the community. Some great examples in history here. In 1859, uh, I think it was a dozen, it was just a few rabbits, European rabbits, were introduced into Australia for the purpose of hunting. By 1869, 10 years later, just 10 years later, Two million rabbits were hunted every year in Australia, and the rabbits were still increasing in number. Uh, by 1950, we estimate there were 600 million rabbits in Australia. They got away and increased in number, and there's so many of them that they're actually uh, out-competing the natural organisms of the environment, and there are marsupials in Australia that are going extinct because of rabbits, okay? We unwisely introduced an organism that isn't naturally occurring in Australia. The consequence has been devastating. Matter of fact, Australia built a fence across the continent from one side of the continent to the other. And the continent of Australia is about the same size as the uh, 48 contiguous states of the United States. It'd be like building a fence from uh, New York City to San Francisco, <laughs> across the entire continent. Amazing, just to keep the rabbits from crossing from the south into the north. So far it's been successful. But this is an example of an exotic introduction that went bad. Another one, 1883, in New Orleans, Chinese kudzu was introduced into the United States, obviously from China, for the purpose of uh, preventing erosion. Uh, when, we, when we're cutting our roads and we create a steep bank along the road on either side or both sides, erosion uh, of that bank that has been stripped of vegetation to hold the soil in very often creates problems of its own. So we wanted something to plant on the banks like that to keep erosion from destroying those banks and, and taking them out. And kudzu was introduced for that purpose. And it does a great job of that. It, 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 when you plant it on that slope, it covers that slope, holds the soil in. Unfortunately, though, Chinese kudzu is from China and doesn't normally live in the United States. And in the southeastern United States, it's apparently there's perfect conditions for it to grow because it continues to grow, not just on the bank, but then up plants that are growing around that, covering trees, it's got such dense foliation that, uh, dense leaves, 
that it actually kills the trees and kills the plants. And it's spreading faster than we've been able to destroy it. We're cre we're, it's in spite of the fact that millions of dollars are invested in trying to destroy kudzu, or at least hold it back, uh, we estimate that kudzu is spreading at over 150,000 acres per year. Uh, here's an example of an exotic introduction gone bad. Another example is an 1816 Chinese wisteria, which is a plant uh, with beautiful flowers, was introduced in the United States for the, for, really for beauty. Uh, it was designed to grow up over porches in the south before we had air conditioning sit out in the, in the, in the porches to be cool. And we wanted a plant that would drape down around the porch, shading the porch. And, and if it had pretty flowers that smelled good, that would be even better. Well, wisteria does that. But just like kudzu, wisteria gets out of control, grows up other trees, chokes them out, and kills the trees that are native to the area. We've found this to be a problem. Uh, nutria is another example. Nutria is, a, is an animal. Uh, it's a, it's a, an animal that lives in the water, uh, swims around kind of like an otter. Uh, it's from South America. It was introduced for the purpose of hunting. It's got great fur that people would use. But uh, the little guys like digging into the bank of the body of water to, to make their dens. And they often dig into uh, dams and ditches and drain out the water. And it's caused all sorts of problem, uh, problems in the uh, southern uh, United States, Texas, Texas and so on. Another example is the green stink bug that was introduced into Hawaii somewhere around 1961. That one was introduced accidentally. It was, uh, we think it was brought in on a ship that was bringing stuff into uh, to Hawaii. And it was killing crops. It was simply eating the crops that people were, were growing. So people wanted to control the, the stink bug. The stink bug, uh, where it came from, it's controlled where it came from by a parasitic wasp. So in 1963, uh, people took the parasitic wasp from the native location of the stink bug and introduced it into Hawaii for the purpose of taking care of the stink bug. The problem is the parasitic wasp doesn't just uh, control the population of stink bugs. It also has controlled the population of a number of other Austra, um, Australian, Hawaiian uh, insects, including the largest uh, bug in the world found in Hawaii that is uh, being driven to extinction uh, by, the, uh, by the parasitic wasp. We have countless examples, well, not countless, there's a lot of examples of organisms that have been introduced exotically into environments, and as a result, it has, been, it has caused damage to those environments. We estimate that there's about 4,500 exotic species that have been introduced into the United States. Not all of them cause problems, but many of them have. So we need to be careful that when we introduce new species into an environment, that we make sure that uh, maybe we test it out beforehand to see if, in fact, the species will, in fact, adjust to the new um, environments uh, adequately. Another thing we should do as kings is enhance the unity of the biological systems that we find, that we have already discovered in the world about us. We should, we should search for species that enhance the unity of communities. This is kind of interesting. I guess we can go back to the analogy of the churches. I'm sure you've seen situations, maybe even in classrooms that you've been in or in families that you've been in, where the unity of a group of people it can be disrupted if the wrong kind of person enters the scene, but it can also be made stronger by other people with a certain kind of personality uh, coming onto the scene. There are certain people that seem to be able to go around, make friends of everybody, and, and bring everybody closer together, that certain individuals can actually enhance the unity of a community of individuals. And it's the same way with species, with organisms. 
There are certain organisms that when you introduce them exotically into a community, it actually binds the community together. It increases the unity that exists. It allows even more, in some cases, more organisms to live in that community than otherwise would. These are called keystone species in biology. And as we, as we have learned over the years, there are instances where keystone species can be introduced into communities where they normally don't live and improve those communities. Uh, this is one way we can, in fact, enhance the unity of the communities we have if we carefully uh, examine how exotic introductions may actually improve situations. Another way we can enhance the unity and the beauty of biological systems is to design our landscaping and our cities as we lay out new subdivisions, as we lay out cities and parking lots, you can think to include um, uh, parks and that sort of thing and use not exotic species, which I think we're tempted to do very often, but use native species. Use species that actually live in that particular area. Those species have an advantage over exotic species on a number of levels. First of all, the species that live there, they're obviously designed for that particular climate. They're happy in that climate. Secondly, the, uh, the insects or whatever diseases might affect the plants in that region are the plants that live there are often immune to those diseases, to the local diseases. But you bring in an exotic species and it may actually be prone to the diseases that the nat native plants are, are immune to. So as we use native species rather than exotic species, we may in many cases produce much more beautiful and healthy communities in our parks and so on. We have a number of ways in which we as kings of the creation can in fact improve and beautify, increase the glory of God that is seen in the unity of the biological world.